Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Syria accepts a non-ceasefire plan as Assad tours former rebel stronghold. Tunisia's Ennahda to preserve the secular basis of the state. And Sudan suspends summit with South Sudan following clashes. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad toured the Baba Amir neighborhood of Homs and inspected the scale of damage inflicted on the city. He was accompanied by representatives of specialized institutions. He vowed to rebuild a better neighborhood. Heavy artillery shelling targeting the suburbs of Homs has continued since Tuesday morning. The Syrian Revolution's General Commission said 21 people were killed in a number of Syrian cities. In New York, the UN envoy to the Middle East announced the number of people killed killed in the chaos in Syria has risen to over 9,000. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad inspected the Baba Amr neighborhood of Homs and reviewed the damage inflicted on the city. He listened to the employees working on rebuilding the infrastructure and reviewed the reconstruction schedule, stressing the importance of accelerating the process. As for the workshops, they must keep up the reconstruction efforts. He promised the citizens to rebuild a better neighborhood. Baba Amr will be a much better place than it used to be. It is not clear how long the president's visit lasted, given that artillery and missile shelling operations have continued since Tuesday morning, targeting multiple neighborhoods in Homs, as reported by activists and according to videos uploaded on social networking websites. It was also noticeable that the number of the president's supporters was not as large as Syrian state-run TV has been showing. Activists say the reason may be attributed to the displacement of thousands of citizens from the neighborhood and the city of Homs. The local coordination committees reported that Assad cut short his visit to Homs after his car was fired at. However, it was impossible to confirm this report from independent sources. The Syrian army took control of Baba Amr after weeks of continuous shelling. The majority of its residents have fled and the Free Syrian Army withdrew from the neighborhood. The shelling of Hama and its countryside has not stopped since Monday. A number of deaths and injuries were reported, as well as the outbreaks of fires in many buildings. In addition, many residents in the city were arrested. For the 17th consecutive day, artillery and missile shelling was renewed on Kalata Madik in the countryside of Hama on Tuesday morning. A number of people have reportedly died and surveillance drones were spotted hovering above the city. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights reported that the city of Sarakib in Idlib saw the displacement of 70 percent of its residents in this past period of time. Our BBC correspondent in Beirut quoted the municipality representative of the town of al qa saying Syrian forces entered the area known as Mashari al qa and set fire to six houses by the border. However, the Lebanese army completely denied the reports on the incidents in Mashari al qa A media spokesman for the army confirmed that there was gunfire outside the Lebanese border, but a gunfire exchange was heard at a closer distance inside the Lebanese territories. The UN Arab League envoy to Syria, Kofi Annan, confirmed the Syrian regime has agreed to a six-point plan, a crucial step towards ending the violence and paving the way to a political dialogue. Annan, who has arrived in Beijing, affirmed during his meeting with Chinese Prime Minister Wen Xiaobao that he needs China's assistance to resolve the crisis in Syria. Annan had also discussed the Syrian issue with Russian officials. This comes as Russian President Dmitry Medvedev criticized the idea of having Assad step down. Medvedev, who is attending the Seoul summit, said it was short-sighted to believe that Assad's departure would solve the Syrian crisis. He added the whole world understands that if Assad steps down, the conflict would most likely continue. He also said the Syrian people should decide Syria's fate.
The debate raging over the new constitution in Tunisia has intensified after the Ennahda Islamist movement-led government announced it will not adopt Sharia, or Islamic law, as the main source of legislation. The decision was opposed by members of the Ennahda and its coalition blocs, who said the decision violates the principles on which the party was elected. Meanwhile, the opposition welcomed the move and described it as the country's first step toward the path to democracy. Our correspondent, Ramzi Hafid, reports from Tunis. Sharia so far does not represent consensus for Tunisians. Islam does represent consensus, so we will build our constitution based on Islam. With these words, the Tunis the Tunisian Ennahda movement tried to put an end to the debate over the state's identity, which has been polarizing the country since the downfall of the regime a year ago. However, Ennahda's decision to drop the word Sharia from the constitution while seeking to uphold the first article of the constitution, stipulating that Islam is the official state religion, has sparked debate amongst members of the Ennahda movement and its coalition blocs. Islam is the religion of all Tunisians. Oh, Sheikh, you have fought or pretended to fight for the sake of Islam and Muslims. Unfortunately, upon ascending to power, you abandon all your slogans and principles. I believe that Sharia should be the basis. Sharia doesn't cause fear. I will continue to lobby for making Sharia the source of legislation. This concern was shared by a large number of Tunisians who want Tunisia to be an Islamist and a caliphate state. However, this position wasn't shared by the opposition, which expressed fear that enshrining Sharia in the constitution would allow Islamist right-wing groups to impose their religious principles on the state. Enshrining Sharia in the constitution will allow Islamic principles to take precedent. In turn, Sharia principles will become themselves the constitution, meaning the constitution becomes a second source of legislation. It's wrong to make any law higher than the constitution. Sharia and the constitution are two concepts that are dividing the Tunisian street, which only a year ago was united to topple Ben Ali. It's a Tunisian scene that has not changed much, and Ghanoucha's latest statement is nothing more than a new episode in a series of unfolding developments titled Post-Revolution Tunisia. Ramzi Hafith, Dubai TV, Tunis. South Sudan's authorities said the Sudanese army's fighter jets shelled its border area for the second consecutive day after ground battles broke out between Khartoum and Juba two days ago. Before the accusation, the Sudanese government announced the cancellation of President Omar al-Bashir's visit to Juba, initially scheduled for April 3rd, after South Sudan's army launched an attack on the Heglik region of South Kordofan on Monday. The long border between Sudan and South Sudan, still awaiting demarcation in accordance with the treaty recently signed by the two sides, has suddenly turned into a battlefield in the conflict over the oil-rich areas of the two countries. The region now feels like a war zone. It appears the political table was turned after the Sudanese government announced its new top priority is to fend off what it referred to as an aggression. We will decide on the next move when the issue becomes clear. But all the people are now behind our armed forces. We are all behind our armed forces. For now, we have no comments to make. I mean, we will not comment on the negotiations or the next phase. The course of these events began to move in the opposite direction after South Sudan's president, Salva Kiir Meardit, suddenly announced that the Sudanese army shelled the southern areas and the People's Liberation Army responded by entering the Heglig region in South Kordofan. On the other side, the Sudanese army denied that the People's Liberation Army has taken control of the Heglik region or that any shelling was launched in southern areas. However, political observers believe this new development will further complicate the situation that was already far from ideal. The shocking latest development in the Heglig region will first strengthen the extremist position on both sides, meaning the people who do not wish to have any rapprochement between the two countries. In addition, it will prompt others who desire peace to work outside the framework of negotiations. Military operations will not solve the ongoing crisis between Sudan and the South. Only negotiations can resolve these situations. These rapid and dramatic developments come only three days 
days after the latest visit of Pakin Amun, head of South Sudan's government delegation that is negotiating the unresolved issues between the two sides. The visit was met with great optimism. Security is one of the most outstanding issues on the agenda. However, it did not even succeed in activating the non-aggression pact recently signed by the two sides. The optimistic spirit created by the latest visit did not last long. The military conflicts have altered the relationship between the two sides from engaging in dialogue to war. This development is the worst option for both countries under the extremely sensitive circumstances. Al-Tahir al-Mardi, Al Jazeera, Khartoum. Dozens of political activists in Egypt organized a protest in front of the state council building in Cairo as the council is reviewing a number of lawsuits against the formation of the founding committee to draft the constitution. Participants in the protest chanted slogans condemning what they referred to as the monopoly of the committee by the Freedom and Justice Party, the political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Salafi al-Nur Party. The protesters raised banners demanding that all Egyptian communities take part in drafting the country's new constitution. In this context, Egypt's Supreme Council of the Armed Forces convened an emergency meeting today with a number of political parties, including the Freedom and Justice Party affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi al-Nur Party. The meeting discussed the crisis caused by the formation of the committee to draft the new Egyptian constitution and the withdrawal of a number of candidates in protest of what they described as unbalanced representations. Meanwhile, the Shura Council is meeting with the Brotherhood today to discuss the possibility of nominating one of its members to run in Egypt's presidential elections. Police today announced that they are seeking a third person who may have been involved in the recent Toulouse killing spree during which seven people were killed, including three Jewish children and a rabbi. Meanwhile, the Al Jazeera television network has reportedly received video footage taken by the gunman during his murderous rampage at the Jewish school. More in this report from Dennis Zinn. Eyewitnesses to the shootings at the Jewish school in Toulouse earlier this month told investigators that the gunman, Mohamed Mera, had a camera strapped to his chest. This morning, the Qatar-based Al Jazeera network announced that it received a video shot by the killer. Soon after, Al Jazeera's Paris bureau chief said the network has not decided yet whether or not to air the pictures. He said that the station's executives are carefully considering the consequences of such a broadcast. French President Nicolas Sarkozy later issued a passionate plea to the Qatar-based TV network to refrain from showing the footage. France is still reeling from the killings, he said, and there's no need to add to the shock. Late this afternoon, Al Jazeera announced that the material will be shelved and not aired. The French security forces requested a copy of the video. Meanwhile, the Paris police announced that it is seeking a third person who may have been involved in the theft of the scooter that was used to carry out the seven murders. Mera's older brother, Abdelkader, has already been arrested on charges of theft and complicity to multiple murder and terrorism. A police spokesman said it does not appear that Mera acted on orders from a local terror cell. Nevertheless, it is known that he and his brother had connections with jihad militants in the Middle East. Mohamed Mera's father said his son will be buried in Algeria. He said that Mohamed was killed in cold blood without reason and that he plans to sue the French government for the murder of his son. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. In the West Bank, an IDF soldier was stabbed and three Palestinians were shot during an overnight confrontation. The incident took place in the village of Ramun, 10 kilometers northeast of Ramallah. The soldier was lightly wounded in the attack. The injured Palestinians were arrested and are being treated in hospital inside Israel. According to Palestinian sources, the villagers attacked the soldier because he was undercover and they mistook him for a thief. The army confirmed the incident but would not say whether the soldier was in uniform. The president of the UN Human Rights Council said the Israeli decision to sever ties with the organization is very unfortunate. A comment by UNHRC Commissioner Navi Pillay comes in the wake of the Israeli announcement that it will cut all ties with the group following the UN agency's decision 
to probe how West Bank settlements infringe on Palestinian rights. U.S. Ambassador to Israel Dan Shapiro said that he understands the Israeli decision and he charged that the U.N. body neglects far more urgent violations taking place in Syria and Iran. Israel has announced that it will not work with the commission and it will not give it access or assistance of any kind. Palestinian stone-throwing youths clashed with IDF soldiers near the Ofer military prison in the West Bank. Demonstrators were protesting the arrest of Hanna Shalabi, an activist with the Islamic Jihad terror group. Shalabi began a hunger strike in February shortly after she was placed in administrative detention as a security risk to Israel. Shalabi previously spent two years in administrative detention before being freed last October as part of the prisoner exchange deal with Hamas for kidnapped IDF soldier Gilad Shalit. She was rearrested February 16th this year. Prison service officials deny claims by Shalabi supporters that she is on the verge of death as a result of the hunger strike. The results of a blood test uh, showed drastic uh, deterioration. And on the recommendations of the hospital doctors, uh, Hana uh, agreed to receive minerals in her fluids. Uh, this, in a way, protects her, at least for some time, delays some of the ramification on her heart. Mm -hmm. And we believe it prevents a heart attack, at least for the near future. The February 14th coalition has called on Bahrainis to hold demonstrations under the banner, Are You Fighting God?, to condemn the Saudi occupation and exert additional efforts to continue the reconstruction of mosques demolished by the Saudi occupation's army. The coalition also called on Bahraini residents to widely participate in a memorial service to be held this afternoon for Bahraini martyr Ahmed Abdel Nabi in the town of Shahra Khan. On the anniversary of the martyrdom of Isa Kanbar, who was executed by the regime in 1996 during the 1990s uprising, demonstrations broke out across Bahraini regions. The demonstrators chanted slogans demanding the downfall of the regime and the trial of killers. In response, Bahraini regime forces filled residential neighborhoods with poisonous gas as part of their collective punishment measures. Since the spark of the Bahraini revolution on February 14th of last year, the regime has resorted to every violent means to crack down on peaceful protesters across the country as part of its collective punishment measures. Among the most infamous tactics was the use of poisonous gas. In the latest incident, dozens of residents were injured after inhaling gas in the area of Al-Hamala. This news comes after Saudi-backed regime forces fired U.S.-made tear gas in the area. Reports by human rights organizations confirmed the amount of tear gas that has been used against the Bahraini people since the spark of the revolution has exceeded the amount used by the Israeli occupation against the Palestinian people since the launch of the Third Intifada until today. The daily average number of tear gas canisters fired in Bahrain stands at 35, compared to three or four fired daily by Israel on the Palestinians. Despite the crackdown, the Bahraini people are continuing to hold demonstrations across the country's various towns and villages to demand the downfall of the regime. In addition to the downfall of the regime, the Bahraini people are demanding, through their rallies, the expulsion of the Saudi occupiers from their country. The Bahraini revolution marked the anniversary of the martyrs killed during the uprising in the 1990s. Demonstrations were held across various regions to express loyalty to the martyrs, most notably Aisa Kanbar. The residents vowed to continue moving toward the path of the martyrs until all the revolution's demands are achieved. While the Bahraini revolution continues amid the most violent crackdown in the Saudi invasion of the peninsula, the revolution's leaders are using other methods to rebel, most notably hunger strikes. This news comes as rights activist Abdel Hadi al Khawaja enters his 49th day of hunger strike as his health deteriorates.
The IAEA's former chief, Mohammed El Baradai, has warned Israel against any attack on Iran. El Baradai says Israel should be, quote, totally crazy to launch military strikes against Iran. He does not think an Israeli attack on Iran is imminent. Tel Aviv and its Western backers, including the U.S., accuse Iran of seeking nuclear weapons. Tel Aviv and Washington have overtly threatened Tehran with military action. Iran says it does not have nuclear arms, nor is it seeking them. Tehran has warned that it will give a destructive response to any aggression on the nation's soil. Elsewhere in the news now, in Yemen's southern city of Taiz, anti-regime protesters have spilled onto the streets calling for the execution of ousted dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. The protesters also called for the restructuring of the army and the dismissal of Saleh's relatives from authority. Yemenis have long called for the trial of Saleh and his associates. The regime is said to be responsible for the killing of nearly 2,000 people since the popular revolution began in 2011. In January, the interim government approved a draft law that granted immunity for Saleh and his aides as part of a deal brokered by the Persian Gulf Cooperation Council. A convoy of tankers carrying fuel to U.S.-led forces has been attacked in western Afghanistan. Afghan authorities say the convoy came under fire in Farah province. At least five guards were killed as the convoy came under fire. It was guarded by a private security firm. Over a week ago, Taliban militants attacked another convoy in Farah province. At least nine fuel tankers and two escorting vehicles were destroyed in that ambush. NATO supply convoys have been repeatedly attacked by the same group, by the Taliban militants, and now things are getting worse for NATO forces in Afghanistan. And the NATO military commanders here fear that they may run out of uh, fuel and out, as well as food because the Taliban, the, sorry, the Pakistani government has also blocked the NATO supply route uh, in Khyber Pass and also in Chaman. And now the, the NATO commanders are deeply worried about this. That's why they're considering for another alternative route from the Central Asian countries to get their supply to their forces here in Afghanistan. Well, also in Afghanistan, another U.S.-led foreign soldier has been killed. The trooper died in a bomb explosion in the south of the country, which is among the most volatile regions. The death pushes to at least 92, the number of foreign forces killed so far this year. Attacks on U.S.-led foreign forces rise during what's called the Taliban's annual spring offensive across Afghanistan. Egyptian Minister of Culture Dr. Shakar Abdul Hamid inaugurated the first gathering of Arab visual artists at the Shababi Cultural Center in Al Mukhatam. 220 Egyptian and Arab artists are taking part in the gathering, exhibiting their fine artworks that express the various concerns and issues of the Arab nation. The 10 day gathering aims to hold a platform for Arab reunification through the language of visual arts. Here at the Shababik Center in Al Mukatam region, the largest forum for Arab artists is being held to display the universal language of visual arts. 230 visual artworks, including photographs, paintings, graphic designs, and sculptures, represent a window into Arab culture, through which Arab artists are able to express Arab concerns that have become one and the same, and a need of unification through the universal language of art. Here, we also confirm that it is the Arabic language. It confirms that there is a shared heritage and history, a joint path, a shared life, and a shared future. Artists responded to this call, and I think those who presented their work represent the first step of a pan-Arab artistic project. I submitted two pieces. They represent the countryside of Egypt. Through my relationship with the Egyptian people, I showed that they are a noble people. 
17 Arab countries are participating in the Arab Visual Artists Forum, proving Egypt is a pioneer in the field and provides a window into the creation of Arab artists. These artworks represent the concerns of their creators' respective countries of origin, expressed through a visual language that may be the only means for them to realize their dreams. Olives represent Palestinian land, Palestinian history, and Palestinian contributions. With this work, I try to transfer Sinai, the beloved Sinai in Egyptian land, to the motherland of our capital, Cairo. The visual language is a universal language that any visitor can interpret in their own way. This is a traditional piece about women. It shows their concerns for their home and country. It is worth mentioning that this gathering has no link to any government institutions, even if the Minister of Culture displayed support for the forum by attending and engaging with the various generations of artists. The Minister was only showing interest in honouring those creative souls. I believe if everything presented here was written in the press in order to unify the Arab world, it would never happen the way it is happening right here. At the forum, Arab artists gathered under the word equality, for which we are in urgent need. Visual arts are the best evidence and expression of this word. Sam Tigi, Nile TV. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.